ITV, sponsored by LG. <laughs> City, Yano Trulli pouring into pits. Just listen to the crowd. Their stand, where stand. So it looks like we're going to have a six car start. It's the strangest race ever, and it gets underway now. A ridiculous spectacle as Formula One self destructs in the USA. The paying public at Indianapolis make their feelings clear. A doddle for Ferrari, but F1 stinks. Now is the time to clear the air. Normal service resumes in France. <laughs> And Alonso again then with a brilliant performance for his second consecutive pole here in Manny Corn. The classy Spaniards are pole sitter at Renault's home Grand Prix. Just 23, Alonso still on course to become the youngest world champion ever. Race 10 means it's effectively half time in F1 2005. Welcome to Manny Cor for the French Grand Prix. Hello there, good afternoon. When you foul up in peak time at the self-styled motor racing capital of the world, you create waves that take some time to calm down. Since the Indianapolis uh, fiasco, the Michelin Tire Company have offered a full refund to every spectator there. The seven teams who did not race have been summoned to Paris by the governing body, the FIA. Ted Kravitz takes up the story. Formula One's been playing the blame game in France this week. The seven Michelin teams were found guilty of not coming to a race with the right equipment. The bosses are angry. Six teams will appeal. Simple fact is the option of not appealing would have been guilt by admission and we aren't, we're guilty of nothing. We're just guilty of putting the driver's safety first. The situation is steeped in F1 politics. ITV has seen a consultation document that will be discussed by everyone except Ferrari and Jordan at a meeting next week. On that agenda, a potential change in the sports governance. How do you react to, to some of the teams, Max, saying actually it's you that's the problem here? It's just nonsense because the thing is that the problem is they didn't have the right, right equipment. And suppose it had been different and it had been Bridgestone and Ferrari and the Bridgestone teams had come to Charlie Whiting saying, we've got a problem with our tyres, can you put a chicane in turn 13? You imagine the Michelin tyres would have fallen about laughing. The day after Indy, Michelin's share price dropped 3%. Michelin have tried to defuse the situation by refunding the fans the cost of their race tickets. Won't this cost them millions? Maybe, but uh, when you make a mistake, you have to pay for it. Why did it happen? Well, simply Michelin made a huge mistake. They underestimated the loadings that the bank turn 13 would put on the tyre. It couldn't cope with the stress and would blow itself apart after 10 laps. It was not a safe tyre. Well, it was crystal clear by that time already. You know, we, we had a tyre failure on Ricardo's car. I had a tyre failure after the eight, eighth lap. I think even Jano had a problem on his uh, free practice tyre already. So, if, uh, you know, we all knew that it was impossible to drive. The only way the Michelins could race was if the speed was reduced by building a chicane in the middle of turn 13. Without a chicane, seven teams had no choice but to pull out. Possible solutions were suggested. Why couldn't the Michelin drivers just slow down through there? You don't drive slowly in a fast corner. That is a driver killer because someone else can misjudge the, the speed. I would defy anyone as a driver to, to believe you could have that as an option. We had so many meetings uh, that morning in, in Indianapolis that uh, everything was quite clear about the problem and about the safety. We should have found a way to still be able to drive that afternoon. 
maybe not race, but drive. When I went on the formation lap, I felt really sorry for, for the, all the spectators, all the fans, because they, they thought that they would see a good race, a good start, but we knew already that we drive to the pits. Again, if it comes down to my choice, I want to race. It's fundamental to being a racing driver that you, you want to go out there and race. You know, cars fail, whether we like it or not, um, all the time. As stupid as it may sound, the day that you decide that you're not prepared to take a risk is the day you retire. Probably more than anybody out there was the hardest guy to stop. Because, you know, they're half of the fans were Colombians. You know, and knowing what they what people make in Colombia and the amount of people that managed to get there, it's hard to see how they just win their money. It's a sport and it's a show and it's I think it's bad that politics got involved and and politics were above the sport. I think it's I think that's that's pretty bad. Politics got in the way that's sort of a nightmare revisited there um, looking at it Bernie do you think now that something could have been done to give us a race there uh, with hindsight maybe yes but I mean hindsight's a wonderful thing at the time we had so many meetings it got so confused and every time we found a solution the side effects were worse I mean in the end the truth of the matter was we didn't want an accident obviously where we could hurt anybody I mean really now I suppose if we'd have all got together and said look we need to entertain the public because that's our job why can't we all run Bridgestone tyres? Because they, they were okay. Um, it would have solved the problem, but it wasn't that easy at the time. Did egos get in the way? There's some big characters around this paddock. Yep, I think you're right. I think it's a lot to do with it, and it's continuing as well. How hard did you work personally to make this race happen, and how badly do you feel that you've been blamed for it not happening? Well, I mean, we, I did everything that could possibly be done, and, and again, with hindsight, the best thing we did was not to have a race certainly with the mission tires a mission had been really really super they said look we made a mistake that's it and it's no different really in true if you think about it if there's a chef cooking for a banquet puts too much salt in the food and the food's no good because that's what happens with building tires for a race the tires here at Manicor is built for this race and they're useless after that but out there, there were millions of people waiting for the banquet for the United States Grand Prix, and then they got a pretty scruffy old morsel, really, didn't they? What would you like to say to them? We're terribly, terribly sorry for everybody, all the TV viewers worldwide as well. I mean, it was really, really bad. At least the people that bought the food, and it wasn't very good too much, so got their money back. Mm. How badly did you feel deep down? People say to me they've never seen you so angry. Well, I was upset with a lot of this. I was upset, I mean, as I say, people's egos got in the way of reality in the end. Is it dead now in the United States, Formula One? You said at the time you thought it was looking pretty bleak. Yeah, but I think now we're going to, we, we'll find a way. We, we, we'll be back next year for sure. Without getting too involved in politics, um, Max Mosley is not a very popular figure in, in this paddock. And I know you work very, very closely with him, Bernie. Is it time perhaps for a change there for, for F1's future? Well, they have to find somebody that's better than Max. Max works very, very hard doing what he does. I mean, um, people say he meddles in Formula One where he shouldn't, but, I mean, that's opinions. So he's really the FAA referees and, and the police. Yeah. But he was sitting at home back in Monte Carlo and effectively stopped the Grand Prix, if I understand it correctly. No, he didn't stop it. I mean, he was against the chicane put in, being put in, and as I say, with hindsight, I'm pleased we didn't. Mm. You feel sorry for the fans out there. Do you feel sorry for the drivers as well who suffered a lot of personal abuse out to Indianapolis? Um, yeah, I mean, we all suffered abuse, I suppose. You know, the drivers shouldn't have got any abuse because they wasn't allowed to drive. The mission said you can't run. Just finally, you're a fellow who always looks for a positive in every situation. I must admit, I am struggling, but tell us the positives from the United States Grand Prix. Well, where we wasn't very well known in America, and if this had happened to any of the other series in America, it wouldn't have been printed. In our case, we're headlines all over America, what happened, and particularly me with my lady with the white dress. <laughs> yes, well, we, won't, we won't tell everybody what you said there because they, they took it pretty badly over there. I don't think we'd, our viewers would like it too, too much either. Uh, it was a bit of a sexist remark there, but, but just, no, just... No, 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 it was a joke and they... I know it was a joke, yeah, no, no, I know. But just, just um, uh, a, a final thought from me about this race here. It's important we get an absolute corker this afternoon. Absolutely, 100%. We need them all doing the job. Okay, we appreciate your time. Thank you very much no, indeed. No, thank you. Thank you for, for joining us. Sorry for the viewers.
OK, thank you, Bernie. And the main point of view on the track about uh, the fiasco at Indy is that all of a sudden Michael Schumacher has emerged as a genuine contender for the driver's title once again because the, the top two were doing very, very little, Alonso and Raikkonen, and Michael Schumacher has moved up there into third place. Barrichello has been on the last three podiums. Trulli's Toyota, that is on the front row here. But the Williams pair, Heidfeld and Weber, they are off the pace. Fisichella level with the top Brit, David Coulthard. The Scott won here five years ago, but Coulthard's been hampered by running early in qualifying. Tony Jardine has, has joined me now. Now, Tony, what about the relationship between the drivers and the governing body post-Indy? Well, it's not good. And the big problem is the Grand Prix Drivers Association, of which uh, David Coulthard is a director and of which Michael Schumacher is the president, don't have any teeth. They have a voice but no teeth. They signed a document, all 19 of them, backing the fact that they should have a chicane and that they all wanted to race at Indianapolis. Michael Schumacher didn't. They had a GPDA meeting here to admonish their own president and they, they are meant to circulate another document. We also read on the websites this morning, it was reported on the websites, that David Coulthard said to the other members of GPDA that he'd had a telephone call from Max Mosley who was expressing his displeasure with the position of the drivers and they weren't allowed to go to the World Council meeting either. But they're in the front line. They can tell us all about safety and they should be listened to. Okay, Tony, thank you very much indeed. Let's get on with the action, shall we? Let us review qualifying. This is a relatively short circuit here at Manicure. And if you make a single slip, it can cost you very dearly indeed. Just a second, separating the top nine in qualifying. Let's join our commentators, Martin and James. So qualifying for the French Grand Prix here at Manucourt and judging by free practice it looked like the fight for pole was going to be a straight one between Renault and McLaren but as ever in Formula 1 it's a much more complicated picture isn't it? Yeah there are an awful lot of politics and dramas going on just below the surface and the drivers are being sucked into that numerous meetings going on but they've had to keep their heads clear and get that single lap done. Because of his problems in Indianapolis, Ralph Schumacher was first out in qualifying. He found a slippery track and this lockup didn't help either. Ralph was second fastest in practice, but the conditions didn't work for him in qualifying and he wound up 11th. David Coulthard was the first of the Michelin cars who withdrew at Indianapolis. He too found the track slippy. Despite aerodynamic updates from Red Bull, they're the slowest Michelin runner here. With Kimi Raikkonen forced to change engines before qualifying, this was a great opportunity for Juan Montoya to challenge for his first pole, but this mistake at 180 really cost him. There's a lot of questions about how much fuel Montoya's got in the car. He wound up just eighth on the grid. Williams came here with a substantially revised aerodynamic package, and although the computers may say it's working fine, it doesn't show him a stopwatch. Weber is 12th and Heidfeld 14th. Long faces all round. Takuma Sato have been quick all weekend and BAR have worked hard on the car in high aerodynamic downforce configuration. The result was a very competitive package and Sato on the best form of the season so far. He was fourth on the grid and put the pressure on his teammate. World Championship leader Fernando Alonso has been the most consistent qualifier recently despite all the pressure. With Raikkonen bound to take a 10th place drop on the grid, this was a great chance for the Spaniard to capitalise. He held his nerve and to the delight of a French crowd, he delivered the provisional pole lap. After Sato's excellent showing, Jensen Button knew he needed something special, but the Englishman just didn't have the speed of his teammate. Perhaps fuel load played a part in it, but Jensen was four tenths of a second slower than Taku, and he took only seventh on the grid on a track he really enjoys. Jensen's going to have to work hard this afternoon to get the podium he so desperately wants ahead of next week's British Grand Prix. Kimi Raikkonen and blew his engine spectacularly on Friday and that meant a 10 place drop on the grid. He knew this and attacked like crazy on his qualifying lap. With an upgraded engine and aerodynamics kit, McLaren is the standout car at the moment. But Kimi wound up third, which became 13th after his penalty. Jarno Trulli has hustled the Toyota to the front of the grid on three occasions already this year. And this lap put him right back there. Formula One's most consistent qualifier over the season delivered for Toyota, missing out on a second consecutive pole position by just a tenth second. Trulli was the last of the Indianapolis non-racers and that meant the Minardis and the Jordans had a rare privilege of a late qualifying slot. They all pushed hard but none more so than Christian Albers. What a moment! He almost threw it at the scenery but skillfully managed to gather it all together. Well, the Bridgestone seemed to be struggling in the final part of the lap. Rubens Barrichello lost time there, but Michael Schumacher has started very brightly. Lately, he's opted to run an aggressive fuel load in qualifying to get himself at the front of the grid. And once again, he bought himself track position. 
third on the grid for the reigning world champion. But Renault had their pole at home, and the great friends Alonso and Trulli had the front row annexed. It was the sixth career pole for Spaniard Fernando Alonso, and with world championship rival Kimi Raikkonen down in 13th, it was a perfect day for him and his French team. All weekend has been very confident, but uh, now starting first even more. So for tomorrow, I don't see any reason to, to don't think in the, in the victory. I'm definitely aiming for podium, yeah, for not the podium of uh, this year for Toyota, but uh, the race is long, anything can happen. This place is one of the few where you can play around a little bit with tactics, but uh, hopefully the others are stopping early and then we will, uh, we will gain. It's no secret that Renault is going to be very quick and is the team to beat, but uh, we hope uh, we can do a better job. I mean, we will try very hard. So another cracking qualifying job by Fernando Alonso, but Martin, Kimi knew he was going 10 places back on the grid. His strategy adjusted accordingly. Can he come through and challenge today? I'd be surprised if he takes the win, but his car is mighty through the long turn two at Estoril. So he'll be quick down the back straight and overtaking a lot of cars, I think, into the Adelaide hairpin. But the, the front of the grid may be just out of reach for him. What about Montoya? We saw him making that mistake, maybe two or three tenths lost there, but he's still seven or eight tenths of a second slower than Raikkonen. It can't all be fuel. Why so slow? Well, we better hope it is fuel. If he doesn't stop one less time than the uh, front of the grid today, I'll be amazed he did a poor job. It's strange because the McLaren seems a great car here. Yeah, it's, it's got good speed, but we've seen other cars that have been disappointing too. The Williams and the Red Bull are the, the tail enders of the budgeted teams. And certainly the, we were expecting great things of that Williams with the new aero package. Yeah, both of them well budgeted, as you say. Jensen Button, can he grab the podium here today before Silverstone? Yeah, his, his car looks great. Jensen should be in good form. He's got to pass his teammate first. He's ahead of him on the grid. Look forward to it. Manicor, the French Grand Prix, 4.4 kilometres, that's two and three quarter miles. It's a 70 lap race, a highly technical and very smooth racetrack. Let's take a look on board with pole sitter Fernando Alonso. This is a pressure lap with Renault at their home Grand Prix. Down to turn one, he's going to shift up right on the apex, full throttle, no problem. Thread the car through the small chicane into the heart of Estoril, turn two. Lower speed, 125 miles an hour, 165 before you reach the exit. That kills the front left tyre during the race. Bring it gently to the left-hand side for the heavy braking zone of Adelaide hairpin. Down five gears to just 50 miles an hour, lean on the kerb on the exit, try to minimise the traction control for tremendous acceleration. Down to the Nürburgring chicane, about 160 miles an hour. Watch him thread the eye of the needle through there and begin to brake in a straight line initially, edging the car into the white line of the 180 degree corner. Strain it as early as you can, turn at the last moment, sweep through the left-hander, but focus on the Imola chicane. 170 miles an hour, sweep down the hill, cut the chicane if you can, and bring it to the left-hand side for Chateau Doe. Wow, I've never seen a car turn in so well in that corner, sweeping downhill towards the end of the lap, up to 170 miles an hour. Big braking zone for Lee Say. There's room to breathe on the exit initially, but then it tightens. Call the chiropractor, the last chicane curbs. Ow! As he lands, floors the throttle over the line, lifts immediately to save fuel for the race. It's close up front, just half a second between the top nine as Alonso claimed his second French pole for Renault. Truly on the front row for the fourth time this year. Third, Schumacher showed Ferrari form, just one tenth off pole. Fourth, Takuma Sato in the thick of it. Fifth, Barrichello faded in the last sector. Vissi lost momentum, three tenths dropping him to six, button seventh in the BAR. Eighth, Montoya's McLaren suffered from an early qualifying slot. Ninth, and happily completing the top ten, Massa and Villeneuve for Sauber. Eleventh, Ralph Schumacher's Toyota. Twelfth, Weber. Thirteenth, Raikkonen qualified third, but his charge affected by a ten-place engine penalty. Fourteenth, Heidfeld. Fifteenth, Coulthard was too cautious. Sixteenth, Clean, who crashed on Friday. Seventeenth, Carter Cairns, Jordan. Eighteenth, Friesacker. Nineteenth, Montero's Jordan. And twentieth, Christian Albers in the second Monardi. Tony, we're in the middle of nowhere here in France. Tough place to get to, but you're rewarded when you arrive. We've had great instances. Remember that one last year, final corner. Uh, Jarno truly taking a nap, and Rubens Barrichello takes him. I know, it was super. And, and Jarno had gone to sleep, and he was heading for third place on the podium. Rubens Barrichello had other ideas. Watch this again. The very last chicane coming up on the last lap. Steals that podium position. So important for Renault, uh, but that was gone. 
And of course, Flavio Briatore was absolutely livid afterwards. And I think that was a contributory factor to Jano losing yeah. his job at Renault. It was Tata Trulli after that, wasn't it? <laughs> Three years ago, Michael Schumacher sealed the world title here only because Kimi Raikkonen had some horrible luck when he was in the lead late on. Yeah, Kimi had done a great job and he was heading for his very first victory. There'd been no oil flags and you can just see McNish's Toyota up there, which had dropped all the oil. And Kimi, a little bit of a rookie there, a little bit raw, didn't see anything, but wasn't aided by any flags, and we were livid by that. He just slid wide enough, and you can see Schumacher going through there to take the win in the World Championship. That was a great shame. But just showed you Kimi, you know, in his form, <laughs> even then in 2002. Takuma Sato's on the second, the second row here, in shape to deliver. He will not want the engine to go like it did last year, though. No, he wouldn't, but this is his best grid since last year on the European Grand Prix when he was on the front row. He's fourth, right alongside Michael Schumacher. Schumacher. He's right in the thick of it. Honda, of course, done a lot of work uh, recently in Jerez with the chassis, and he's happy they've carried over all this development work to here. Thanks, Tony. Well, for quite a while now, we've been telling you that BMW want to have a team of their own. Next season, they will have. BMW have bought Sauber, and that has implications for Williams and indeed for Jensen Button as well. Louise Goodman takes up the story. The six-year marriage between Williams and BMW has ended in divorce, with BMW opting to buy the Sauber team in order to take control of its own destiny from the start of 2006. Competition has become so intense in Formula One that you can only be successful if your entire package is perfect in all its areas. And that is why we have decided to take responsibility on the whole package, not just the engine. Peter Sauber has decided to relinquish control to guarantee sufficient investment to ensure the growth and long-term stability of his team and staff and for other more personal reasons. I'm 62 <laughs> and I have to think about uh, to stop. It's not a problem for me, <laughs> but for this, is, uh, I think it's also a good solution. Frank Williams might not be laughing, but he is putting on a brave face, insisting the split will not have any effect on the team's performance this season. We both need to win for the rest of the year. That's very clear. A lot of money's been spent to do so. But what of the future? What engines will Williams run next year? Contrary to rumours, Toyota's told ITV it doesn't have the capability to supply an extra team. Cosworth's keen to do a deal, but the company's small and lacks development budget, which leaves Honda. We've had um, contact from Williams uh, perhaps uh, a month ago, but uh, we just had initial discussions, uh, nothing more than that. Or paying for BMW engines. If we stay with BMW, it'll be a very smooth continuation of what present exists. And I believe that if we do change, if we were to change, that the way it would be handled would see, given the two professional bodies involved, a reasonable uh, transfer of information, sufficient to make us still competitive next year. And what about the drivers? Mark Webber is confirmed at Williams for 2006. I've been through tougher times before, and uh, Frank's a... Is a, is a fantastic uh, individual and so uh, with Patrick you know we've got to try and find a way to uh, to turn it into a, a way which we can get better results next year even if it is with BMW or whatever. Jensen Button has remained tight-lipped on the subject here in France. Williams has an option on his services for 2006 but will he be quite so keen to return to the team which gave him his Grand Prix debut if they don't have a works engine deal? At the moment, there are more questions than answers as far as Williams' future is concerned, but Frank isn't laying the blame for the uncertainty at BMW's door. Well, Formula One is totally results-driven, and it's obvious to anybody competing, and if you don't deliver, you're going to pay the penalty eventually, and clearly we have disappointed BMW, and so they view it, and that's entirely their decision, and they're truly entitled to it. Tony, he is the ultimate F1 fighter. You chatted to Sir Frank this morning. He's absolutely determined to keep his team among the elite. No question. I mean, he assured me that they will find an engine solution, that they won't lose sponsors. He said I was negative yesterday, but I was only being negative more about BMW. Why are they leaving behind such an elite Grand Prix team who've won nine World Constructors Championships, seven World Championships for, for drivers? They are very special. BMW got a 
huge, tough job. Not only is it uh, nearly quadrupling their budget, they've got to put two cultures together. It's much easier being an engine supplier. Going to do the whole show together without that vital ingredient of the racers in Williams sure. is going to be tough. OK, give us your views about that and any other story that we've covered today. Perhaps you've got thoughts about what Bernie Eccleston had to say. You can email us at paddock at itv-f1.com, our website, an essential hit for you F1 fans, itv.com forward slash F1. Tony is your man in the hot seat this week. And now it is competition time. Get smart. Watch carefully for the question after the answer to our indie poser. In Indianapolis, we offered you the chance to win a day out as a guest of VAR at a Silverstone test with exclusive access to the VAR garage. Paul Medway from the Forest of Dean was the lucky winner. He knew that Michael Schumacher came home first in last year's US Grand Prix. This week, three people can each win a voucher worth a thousand pounds to spend at an Eden Park store. Their clothing's really popular with a lot of top sports stars and with our very own Jim Rosenthal. This is his shirt being modeled here by the lovely Lydia. Eden Park are also the official clothing supplier for the British and Irish Lions. To enter the competition, just answer the following question. Which circuit currently hosts the French Grand Prix? Is it A, Paul Ricard, B, Manicourt, or C, Green? To enter by phone, call 0901293 or text F1, followed by your answer, A, B, or C, to 63337. Calls and texts cost a pound, plus a standard network rate. And hurry up, we need your answer by this Wednesday. I must try that Lydia style sometime. You never know, I might just do it as well. I'm sure many of you watched the Goodwood Festival of Speed show that followed our qualifying programme yesterday. Fernando Alonso, he was on a rare weekend off, by the way, enjoyed himself hugely and made many new fans along the way. Well, we followed Alonso around and got him to respond to some celebrity questions as well. We have two weekends off, uh, this one and uh, one at the middle of July, and both are uh, events programs, so I think uh, we have to, to relax uh, probably at the end of the year. Fernando, it's great having you here at the Festival Speed and we're thrilled with the way the season's going for you. I hope you've had a bit of a chance to walk around the paddock and have a look at some of the other cars and wondered which of all the cars here you'd most like to have a go in. Well, or Max, I think uh, the best car I, I saw today is probably the McLaren of uh, Senna because I was a big fan of him. Uh, if I have to choose one car uh, that is not the, my, my Renault, probably I chose that one. How would you like to try the cars I raced on the circuits we used to race where precision was a very important thing? Hi, Stalin. I think uh, 1950s uh, were a, a good time to race. Obviously the cars were not uh, uh, developed and the technology we have now is uh, much more interesting. But uh, also to, to drive those cars I think uh, were very, very interesting and for the driver point of view maybe uh, an extra motivation because the driver taking part maybe more in the in the results of the of the race. You must to push uh, very hard. <laughs> to win the championship? Well, uh, René, I think uh, you, you are completely right. Uh, we are in a good position now, we have a gap, but it's true that uh, our opponents, uh, McLaren and Ferrari especially, are uh, closing the gap. They are a little bit stronger than us at the moment, so we need to develop the car, we need to improve the car, and we need to win races. This is the only key to, to be world champion. <laughs> single-handed you have transformed the attitude of Spain as a country to Formula One but in the process you have lost your private life how much does this worry you 
Hi Mari, I think uh, I was uh, expecting this question coming from you. <laughs> and uh, it's true that uh, now in Spain has been a big, big change. Formula One is getting much more interesting now. And I get recognized uh, everywhere. It's like uh, a little bit like here, like in good, good, but uh, every day. But uh, I try to to be uh, as normal as possible and uh, try to do the, the normal things. Get him! All my life has been uh, competitive. When I was a boy, three or four years old, always uh, run with my mother, doing competitions, uh, to try to see which uh, arrive first to the next uh, traffic lights, to always things like that, and uh, always try to win. My mother is too slow now at the moment, <laughs> but uh, yeah, with my friends always. Uh, anything I play or anything we do is always for a reason. It's always uh, try to beat them. Winning races in a pram, I'm sure. Come what may, Fernando Alonso will go to Silverstone as the world championship leader. Yeah, it's the British Grand Prix next weekend. Silverstone, I'm delighted to say, is a 100,000 sellout. Jensen Button really needs your support. Let's hope he goes there with a few points as well. So Jackie Stewart has been giving Jensen the benefit of his considerable Silverstone experience. So, Jackie, how did you first get started in, in, uh, in racing, not just Formula One? Well, I was quite late. I didn't drive a race car until I was 23 years of age. So how many years did you race before you actually got into um, a Formula One car for the first time? Two and a half. You're kidding. Yeah. <laughs> That's unbelievable. Yeah, two and a half. <laughs> Why did you start? I originally started in karting because I was, a, I was such a lively kid. <laughs> the old man, I, I didn't, didn't enjoy football, no other ball sports. So the old man bought me a go-kart just for fun. I said, Dad, I want to race, Dad, I want to race. So he put me in for a race and I, I won my first race. Oh, that's a good one. By the time you were 16, you had done more first corners, more first laps than I had done in my entire career. <laughs> I only raced totally 11 years, Yeah. my entire career. <laughs> I've, done so, I've done eight, this is my 18th year this year. How many Grand Prix now? Oh, well, it's 100 at the end of this year, I think, 100 Grand Prix. Oh, well, that's good. Well, I never did 100. I had just been 99. Yeah. You didn't want to finish it off with 100? Well, a friend got killed on the Saturday, yeah. Francois Sever, my teammate. I knew it was going to be my last race. Are you superstitious? For me, I always do the same thing before a race. I'll sit on a, a big black ball with a steering wheel, and I'll drive around a lap with my eyes closed. And I'm normally within a second of my lap time or two. And I'm there making the noises and everything. <laughs> so <laughs> we've got to sit here. Exactly, yeah. There. You're not watching it. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think it takes, Jensen, mentally, to win? Well, this is something I should be asking you, because you've won many a Grand Prix. But um, for me, I think you have to be so focused, so determined. And also, if something goes wrong with the team, not just say, it'll be better next time, but actually push the team as hard as you possibly can. For me, I think it's the removal of emotion. To try and be clinically clean mm. by the time I've got into the cockpit at the start of the race. If I were clean and I had no distractions, boy, was I in better shape. Finally, getting to the start finishing line. Yeah. I mean, this is what you most want. Why? You want to arrive here first, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Nowhere else, just first. Right. What feeling is it to win? Oh. Obviously, I've never experienced it in a Formula One car. Nice one. Nice one to win. The British Grand Prix in front of your own public, a good feeling. I mean, that's the one I would want you most yeah. to be able to do. Well, it's the one I'd most want to win, you know, in front of the home crowd. The emotions would just be phenomenal. Oh, and when you cross the line here, you've got the team on the right, and you've got all the fans on the left. Oh, it must be a, a pretty special moment. Let us hope that is reality next Sunday. Here on ITV1, we start our Silverstone qualifying 12.10 on the Saturday. Race day, we gear up at midday. The British Grand Prix highlights 11.40 next Sunday night. Let's have a word with uh, Jensen Button now, shall we? He's down there with Ted Kravitz. Yes, indeed. And Jensen, I know you're looking forward to Silverstone, but uh, you've got this race to get through first. Yeah, I think it's going to be a good one. It's, it's very, very hot out there at the moment. Circuits at about 52, 54 degrees, so it's 
stonkingly hot, but I think it, it's going to be all right. You know, it's, it's a race where I think we can be very strong. What does that heat mean? Because it is hotter than Friday when you last did long runs on these tyres. So what's it going to mean for the tyres? Oh, well, it's going to be harder for the tyres. Um, you know, the rubber is going to go down a lot quicker. There's going to be quite a bit of grip out there from the rubber, but from the heat, it's going to uh, take it away again. So I think towards the end of the race, there's going to be a few people in tyre. Well, hopefully going to be having a lot of oversteer on the tyres. So we'll uh, make a few places up there because I think we've got a very good strategy. Have a good race. Thanks very much. 49 degrees, the latest track temperature, Manicure in Burgundy. Pretty much the bull's eye of France. 6,000 Renault fans are here. When you rejoin us, Martin Brundle's going to be darting round the grid. Toyota Tessa Olivier made a guest appearance in the third car on Friday, but other than that, Olivier, not a single French driver on this grid. Yeah, I know it's a shame. It's very difficult, but we need to accept this year. I hope so. All the Federation, everybody in F1 understood it's quite important because the, the French Grand Prix is full of spectators. I hope so next year somebody happen and somebody stand up to the Formula 1. 80,000 spectators here today, I understand. I guess they're going to be cheering for the French team, for the Renault guys. Do you think they can get the win? Well, I hope so. I mean, uh, I think it's a very big event for Renault, but, you know, I'm working for Toyota. The one thing I want is Yarno win the race, so fight for the podium. Thanks, Olivier. Welcome. Olivier Panis, we could have done with him in the Grand Prix. Uh, Toyota actually presented him with the car that he drove at Suzuka, his last driver for Toyota. Renault, 6,000 Renault employees are here filling two stands and uh, supporting their man, Fernando Alonso, absolutely big time, Tony. But this is the busiest month in F1 history. Four races in five weeks. How much of an effect will that have on Montoya and everybody else? Well, I, I particularly want to see how it will affect Alonso. He, on the two weekends off he was meant to have, he was working. And I hope that we don't get into a burnout situation. But there are, you know, 40 points up for grabs from the drivers, looking at Massa there, and 72 constructors points as well. It's a very critical time in the championship. Thank you, Tony. We're going to go down, well, not to the back of the grid, be beyond the back of the grid and uh, Martin is poised on you go Martin thanks Jim yeah I'm right at the back of the grid actually there's an interesting story back here I thought I might have outstayed my welcome at the front for a little while as well but this is the finish line actually it's a displaced grid so they can get the cars in because it's straight out of this chicane which I think is going to play a role in this afternoon's race the two launch pads of the curbs and then they aim the car over here with these uh, quite significant curbs here. I'll put my mobile phone down so you can see that, it, that it's quite a, a, a tall curb onto this astroturf, followed by some a, another curb, a rubber egg crate stuff full of gravel and, uh, and earth, then onto some grass creek. And that's the sort of uh, pain they're giving themselves and their cars all through the Grand Prix. And as the tyres fade, Jensen Button referred to uh, the tyres fading through the race, we could well see some spinners here today. Let's see, uh, I thought we might, uh, they might find a nicer class of people down the back of the grid here. And uh, they're obviously, um, where is your, uh, where's your driver? Where is he? Let's have a quick word with the man who's finished third. How are you doing? Uh, obviously you had the luxury of an open grid two weeks ago in Indianapolis, situation normal today. How's your feeling? Uh, you know, it's back to reality here, you know, back to normal. Um, no, I'm feeling all right. You know, we have a lot of problems this uh, this weekend throughout the test, but uh, qualifying was very good. So the car seems pretty balanced. Good load of fuel, and uh, looking forward for the race. Really push hard. All right. Are you just literally racing the two Minardis and your teammate, or are you hoping to hang on to the back of the Red Bulls genuinely? Uh, it always depends on the strategy. I think I think they're they're pretty heavy. Um, it will be difficult to follow them here, to be honest. We're hoping with the new car to get close to them. Okay, you're a legend now back in Portugal? <laughs> well, more famous now, yeah. Good stuff. Let's see if we can find uh, Friesacker. Uh, to my eternal shame, I'm not entirely sure what he looks like, so I should come down here more often, but he's sitting on the floor looking a bit lonely. We don't get sort of barged about back down there, do we? And we can't see the wood for the trees up the sharp end. But uh, Patrick, uh, Martin Brundle, 
ITV, British Television. You look like you've got a bit of time to talk to us. What are you, meditating down there or something? No, just con concentrating on the race and just focusing what I'm doing, what's happened in the first corner, you never know. So just really concentrating. Now, the fact that in reality you're racing the Jordans and your teammate, surely you just take it easy through the first lap, making sure you don't collect other people's accidents, or do you? are you flat out? No, it's just flat out. It's a race, so everything or nothing. <laughs> Now you've worked hard to get into Formula One. It, my experience is it's even harder to stay here. It's a big pressure game, isn't it? Yeah, it's always, especially to get into Formula One, it's really hard and then to do the work there and stay there. And of course, I want to move up to some better teams and try to do a good job and just try to focus on what I'm doing. Now, we know the track temperature is 49 degrees. Isn't your Botticelli a bit hot sitting there? Yeah, yesterday and the day before was really cold, so we, it's going to be quite tough for the tyres. Right, oh, good luck. Right, let's see if we can find the Red Bulls uh, at the back of the grid, surprisingly. Uh, yeah, let's just have a quick word with Christian Clean. He's a nice little guy. He was charging round on a motocross bike last night. Surprised he didn't break anything. Christian, a quick word. What's this thing here? It's a big uh, cooling west, so we stay a bit cooler. And uh, it's quite good before this girl go in the car to keep your body temperature low. Uh, well, do you take it off then? You take it off before you get in the car? No, definitely I take it off, otherwise I wouldn't fit in the seat and the steering wheel would be right on my, on my chest. What are you doing back here on the grid? What's the problem? We thought you'd be faster. Yeah, I mean, we had quite a bit of problems in qualifying. We were in free practice quite quite quick and were, uh, were up a tenth place around. But I think definitely we are quicker in the race. We have a reasonably good balance on the car and uh, we try to get uh, closer to the front, but it's difficult from the starting position. Have a good one. Right. Christian, lots of dramas. You're a Michelin team boss. Um, what's going to happen now? Is there going to be a, a huge uh, eruption in the next few weeks or do you think it's going to calm down a bit? Well, I hope for Formula 1 it all dies down a bit. You know, the tyre you know, looks OK this weekend. Michelin, I think, understand what the problem is now and hopefully there won't be a reoccurrence. OK, I'm just going to try and grab DC. I'll catch you another time before he gets in the car. He's, um, we've got very little time. Can you run that fast backwards, Andy? DC, some stuff on the websites today about a bit of a, a spat between the drivers and uh, and some various phone calls. What's the story on that? Well, uh, unfortunately, it's like all these things, you know, people get half the information and rumours spread, but the reality uh, is that uh, the drivers obviously have some concerns and uh, we have a, a meeting scheduled with the uh, FIA president on Friday at Silverstone, so uh, we'll discuss that then behind closed doors. OK, I'm sure you've got other things on your mind at the moment. The old hands device is going on. Skidlid closely behind it. Back to you, Jim. Thank, thank you very much indeed, Martin. And Martin in common with one or two of us wearing the badge backing the bid for London for the 2012 Olympics. That decision to be made on Wednesday here in France as the French Air Force uh, buzz over the 80,000 fans. We are in the middle of enemy territory, of course. The Paris bid to the fore here. Martin moving down at the, the back of the grid there. Tony, what, um, what are your impressions about what we have coming up um, in the uh, French Grand Prix? How about the start? Always a crucial area. Yes, it is very crucial indeed. I mean, it is a race of endurance today as much as anything else. The drivers' the fitness will be tested, of course. The tyres will be tested. The engines will be tested. But we've also got to look out for Ferrari because they're back in the mix, I think, quite big style. Because Ross Braun told us, you know, two weeks ago in North America, no, we're not going to do any more development on this car. What did they do last week in Barcelona? Massive development. They've got new diffuser, new nose, new tyres, an engine rig revamp and I expect their race pace to be very very good and I wouldn't be surprised if a Ferrari or two Ferraris are up on the podium. Thank you Tony. 42 points over the last three races for Ferrari and Michael Schumacher in particular. Well after the farce in the USA let me just assure you we have a complete 20 car grid here at Manicure. They all intend to go the full distance as well. 70 laps of the technical and super smooth circuit. We aren't expecting any bottles of the local Burgundy or anything else to be thrown on the track. 6,000 Renault employees expecting that man Fernando Alonso, the pole sitter to give them a reason for a proper celebration. Beware truly, he's totally at home. Sato in the mood to make an impression and so is that man Michael Schumacher seven times a winner at Manicure. Formula One is about to get back on the right track at the French Grand Prix.